Welcome back to Better Than Before. Tony Richards here, excited about our guest today. She's a brand expert, she's an author, she's a speaker, and it's Denise Yan. And she initially cultivated her brand building approaches through several high level positions in advertising and client side marketing. She headed Sony Electronic Incorporated's first ever brand office, where she garnered major corporate awards as the vice president, general manager of brand and strategy. She's run her own firm as an independent consulting partner since 2004. Through her expertise and personal approach uh, on the speaking front, Denise inspires business leaders around the world to build great brands and exceptional organizations. Her keynote presentations have captivated international audiences at conferences, including TEDx, the Consumer Electronics Show, the Art of Marketing, the National Restaurant Show, and the American Marketing Association, among others. I first saw Denise at a Scaling Up conference uh, back in 2000, I can't remember, it was 2015. 15 or 16, but was really thrilled with her uh, presentation about what great brands do. And as an author, we're going to talk today about her latest book. She enjoys challenging readers to think differently about brand leadership. It was that goal in mind that she's written several books, including the aforementioned What Great Brands Do, The Seven Brand Building Principles That Separate the Best from the Rest, and her brand new book that I thoroughly enjoyed reading called Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies. And I'm thrilled to have Denise Lee Yon on the program today. Hi, Denise. Hi, Tony. I'm excited to be with you as well. What a bio. I know. I was going to say, it makes me sound very impressive. (laughs) You are very impressive. And I'm so glad that you joined us here today because I know you've got a wealth of knowledge to share about what I think is just a tremendous subject that a lot of companies, a lot of CEOs really need to pay attention to. But before we get into that, tell me a little bit about your background, where you're from, where you grew up and that sort of thing. Well, I'm actually from kind of your neck of the woods. I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, and went to school in Chicago, but have spent most of my adult life on the West Coast. Um, I lived in San Diego for many years, and now I live in San Francisco. So were you a baseball fan growing up in St. Louis or? Yeah, you know, the Cardinals went to the World Series when I was in high school. One of the benefits of being a straight A student in my school district is we got free baseball tickets all the time. So yeah, we definitely went to the ballpark. That's awesome. So then how did uh, marketing become a fascination of yours? Fascination is a great word because I've always been fascinated with brands, but a little known secret or whatever is, you know, when I was growing up, I actually thought I wanted to be an attorney. This is when LA Law was a really popular show. And I thought, oh, I want to do that. And then I did an internship at a law firm and discovered that it was far less glamorous and exciting than the TV show. And so I went to school just kind of pursuing a general liberal arts background, not sure exactly what I wanted to do ended up selling advertising for the Daily Northwestern, the the school newspaper that I worked on, really just kind of fell in love with this idea of helping businesses connect with their customers. From there, started on my career. So I want to talk to you about this specifically because so many times people miss name, brand, Uh, They're really talking about the process of branding or they're talking about advertising. Yes. And it's one of my pet peeves. And and I I probably get in trouble for trying to straighten people out. So I'm going (laughs) to turn to the expert. Why do you think people don't really understand the brand development type? Uh, you know, why do they misunderstand that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I do think it's because most people think of branding like as in developing a name and a logo and maybe a trademark. And so when they think about developing a brand, they just think about, oh, well, we need to come up with a creative, compelling way to express ourselves. And while certainly that's an important part of your brand appeal, I define your brand as what you do and how you do it. It's really the kind of bundle of values and attributes that you deliver to customers and the way that you do business. So building a brand is a far more um, involved, in-depth, operational business orientation than I think most people would think when they're just thinking about kind of the surface elements of a brand. So for years, 
uh, as a CEO advisor and coach, I've advised my clients in the CEO position that there are six or seven things that you really need to be responsible for and accountable for, and you need to really pay attention to it and maybe you haven't so much before, mm-hmm. but always on that list of six or seven things is culture. Mm. And also one that they're not used to hearing is brand. So I was really excited when your book Fusion came out because it's about this process of combining and synchronizing those two things, culture and brand. Now, how did this big idea sort of uh, conceptualize for you? Well, it first started when I was heading up brand and strategy at Sony Electronics. And at the time, the president and the chief marketing officer, uh, this is back in the late 90s, even back then had started to kind of see that the equity and strength of the Sony brand might be waning. But instead of asking me to work on some big external brand campaign, they asked me to focus on internal brand engagement and alignment. I think, you know, they were very wise and understanding that we needed to make sure everyone in the organization shared a common understanding of what the brand stood for and how we were going to evolve it in order to maintain our competitiveness and and our brand leadership. And so I started working on that. We developed a whole initiative called Being Sony, which was just about um, helping everyone in the organization understand how to interpret and reinforce the brand in their daily decision making and and behaviors. I eventually left Sony, decided to quit and kind of start my own practice and bring a lot of the methods and approaches that I had developed there to other clients. But I will say that, you know, most recently what prompted me to write the book, first of all, I feel like there's just kind of like this culture crisis in America right now, just um, with a lot of companies and a lot of business leaders struggling with how to cultivate a healthy culture. But personally, I had an an experience with a client who wanted me to help them kind of reposition and clarify their brand. But there was a huge disconnect between their brand and culture. And I needed to explain how do you actually integrate these two things? How do you make sure that they're aligned and synchronized, to use your word? And once I realized that I needed to do it for that client, I realize there are probably lots of other business leaders who could benefit from being taken through the steps as well. And so that's how I end up writing the book Fusion. Well, if you're at a four-way stop, let's say, and there's a branded logoed vehicle at the other side of the four-way stop, (laughs) and that driver of that vehicle sort of flips you off in the intersection. <laughs> I mean, that's a combination of culture and brand, right? Because <laughs> because if the culture of the organization is such that that's okay, they just lost a lot of money because that brand lost value. Isn't that right? Yeah, well, it's actually great that you bring up car brands because in my book, Fusion, I write about and and contrast two car brands, um, Ford Motor Company and then VW. In the Ford example, I use it as an example of how Alan Mulally and the whole organization really turned around Ford by unifying everyone around this common one Ford idea. And I contrast that to what happened at Volkswagen, which, you know, I think from a brand standpoint, they had always kind of had this real appeal to a certain kind of person, and especially in the U.S., you know, kind of a brand played the special role in the kind of cultural revolution of the 60s, and it was kind of like this alternative brand that people just loved, and very kind of, I don't want to say like heartwarming, but very engaging and genuine and down to earth, maybe salt of the earth in a way. Um, but then, you know, what we found out a couple years ago is that the culture of the company was so driven by performance standards and the leaders had been so demanding about the specifications of their cars that they ended up cheating on their admissions tests. So I think what was surprising about that, I mean, in addition to just being kind of a bad business practice, was there was such a disconnect between what the culture of the company was like and really what we had thought the brand was. There's several elements in the book that goes into um, different 
pieces of the culture building process, the core purpose, the core values. And there's a quite a lengthy list of things in there that are vital components around the ideology of the company and this, that, and the other. But you really hone in and talk about it's important for organizations to find their sole purpose of reason for being. Is that difficult for, for many leaders? I found it is um, because I think that they that most leaders think about it the wrong way. I think that most leaders will know, OK, we need to have some sort of purpose. So they want to develop some sort of mission statement. So the mission statement ends up being this kind of generic declaration of what the company does and how it's going to meet some certain performance target. You know, we develop cost effective solutions that drive shareholder growth or, you know, something very right. <laughs> like that. Um, Majestic. Yeah. <laughs> and because I think they're thinking about one stakeholder group or one way of looking at their business. And then, you know, there are other ways of looking at their business, like from their brand standpoint, they might want their brand to stand for something specific or, you know, might want to embody a particular kind of higher purpose. You end up with different statements or different ideas and no single guiding light. And so that's why in Infusion, I recommend that you set an overarching purpose, one single purpose, your sole purpose that drives what you do as an organization and ultimately what you want to stand for as a brand. Well, a lot of leaders want to go broad and, you know, they want to encompass all these big ideas. <laughs> but but really what differentiates you is when you can go narrow, right? And specific and and different. Yes, and different. I think uh, Tony, you're absolutely right. I'm, you know, I think that identifying your unique purpose and your unique values is so important because uh, you need to give your employees a reason to join your company and to stay with your company. You need to give your customers a reason to buy from you. And if you're saying and doing the same things as everyone else, then why should they? I think I've even seen you maybe, maybe one of your tweets, but you said instead of unique, maybe think distinct. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I was just reading a paper about the importance of distinctiveness. And they used that word because they felt like it was an even stronger idea than unique. Your differentiation should be so salient that you are the only one or only you know company that does whatever you do. Yeah, you know, I love it when I'm reading along in a book and I go, okay, wow, this is something I haven't seen before. But when I was reading specifically in the brand section, you had a table talking about brand types. And I don't know that I've ever seen that before. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, you know, it's funny because a lot of people have pointed that out. So um, the reason why, I, first of all, just to explain the reason why the book includes this is because, you know, my point is that if you want to integrate and align your brand and culture, you need to be clear about what kind of brand you have so that then you know what kind of culture you need. And so in order to help you get clarity on that, I said, you know, in my experience, generally there are only nine different types of of brands out there. And by brand type, I mean the way that the brand is positioned, like a disruptive brand is a brand type, or a service brand, or a luxury brand. Within that brand type, there are lots of different unique identities that a company would have for themselves. But generally speaking, there's probably about a few ways that you can really position yourself. And so that's why I included these nine brand types. And then I included the top organizational core values that you need to support or to align with that brand type. So I'm going to ask you just kind of a question off the top of my head that we didn't uh -huh. talk about or discuss. But since we now live in a service economy, are there more service brands than any other kind right now? Yes and no. I mean, I would say that generally there are more um, kind of service business models out there. So, you know, rather than selling a product, uh, in many cases, companies are now selling a service. So in that case, you could say that there are more service brands out there, but I use the service brand type to distinguish those brands that routinely deliver high quality customer care and service. That is the thing that they are solely focused on. And an you know, example that I use is USAA, I talk about Nordstrom, I talk about Ritz-Carlton. These are companies that have put 
serving their customers at the center of everything they do. And so then they develop organizational values like empathy and listening and kind of intuition, just really trying to get everyone in the organization to understand what their customers want and need and then be able to deliver on it. And to me, that's very different from simply providing a service. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That was great. I I know a lot of times when I get um, someone new who wants to engage me um, for advisory service or uh, help coach them through, it's usually because there's a big change or a, they've heard of about a new idea they want to implement or a new initiative or something. And, you know, if it's a culture change or something like that, you know, I'm usually really upfront with them and tell them, you know, this is going to take a while <laughs> and it's going to be a little difficult and it might take a minimum of five years for you to get Get this to the place you really want it to be. So the process you describe in Fusion, how's, what's the difficulty of that change process? It's been your experience on a scale of like one to 10 in difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely say it's on the upper end of the scale. Um, maybe not as difficult as recovering from bankruptcy or, you know, executing a very difficult M&A or something like that. But I think that generally it is difficult. The reason why it is, is because it requires relentless commitment and discipline. What I mean by that is integrating and aligning brand and culture is not something that happens overnight. It takes a while to your point. And I think it's easy to maybe get off track or to lose momentum or to get distracted by the day-to-day -day pressures of business. And so I think that you need to be relentlessly committed to making this happen and then disciplined in the sense of using your brand and your culture to guide everything that you do. So when you put your brand and culture at the center of everything you do, then it changes the way you think and act in every way. And sometimes, again, it's difficult to keep that focus, I guess is what I'm saying. Because we're talking behavior. Yes, too, exactly. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's it's it's anybody who's ever tried to be on an exercise regimen <laughs> or ever tried to be on a diet or ever tried to change their own behavior. Just multiply that times 1500 <laughs> or 15,000. Right. Right. I always tell CEOs like the change has to start with you and your team Yes. because you have to be the avatars of this behavior that people, are, you can't expect the front line to be the first to start. You know, we, that's the wrong end of it. We got to start it, you know, as the leaders of the organization have to demonstrate it uh, and be the examples. Yes. And so, so you know, it, it takes a while for that to cascade throughout the organization. Would you agree with that? Or? I completely agree. And that's why in my book, I devote a whole chapter to the importance of leadership. And that's actually the chapter where I talk about Ford versus Volkswagen. And I say, look at the, the leaders of these two companies, what Alan Mulally did at Ford, and then what the German leaders whose names I can't pronounce um, <laughs> at Volkswagen did. And it really shows how influential a leader can be. And I think that, you know, people probably underestimate how hard it is to change culture and brand. I think that they think it should be relatively easy, but it, it's not because you're right. I mean, you're trained, you are changing ingrained behaviors and attitudes and, and it just takes time. I love the book American Icon, yes. which is the yes. story of how Alan changed and he just was disciplined. He wouldn't take no for an answer on his weekly meetings and all the different disciplines that he was trying to institute throughout the organization. Sometimes, uh, in my experience, organizations can identify their purpose, their core values, and they can get a fairly good handle on their brand. But then you talk in the book, which I think is some of the most valuable parts of it, about operationalizing it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so in the book, I lay out five steps or strategies to operationalize this fusion of brand and culture. And the very first strategy is to organize and operate on brand. I mean, use your organizational design and your operational processes to reinforce and advance your desired culture and your desired brand. Kind of going back to my last comment, I think that people think, oh, I, we should just change culture and brand and we kind of do these kind of things off on the side, on the periphery of what we do. But really, you can reinforce your core values. You should reinforce your core values and your purpose 
through the way that you're organized. And when I mean organized, I mean like your org chart, you know, so how much hierarchy do you have versus autonomy? What roles do you have in your organization? Um, maybe there are new roles that you need to create in order to move your organization in a certain direction, or maybe roles that you need to get rid of because they're kind of hanging on to old values or old ways of doing things. You know, maybe there are standards that you need to implement. Um, you know, Amazon is famous for having these like two pizza teams, meaning that they only have have teams that are large enough that can be fed with two pizzas um, because they want to make sure that you know, these teams are tight knit and close and very collaborative. And if you get too big, they um, Amazon just feels like you can't do that. So in your organizational design, you can really advance your cultural priorities and then also in your operations. And operations, I mean everything from planning and budgeting to how you run a meeting. Everything signals something to your people and to your customers. And I think that if you think about how you design your processes and your and your kind of your day-to-day operations again that creates the environment for your desired culture to flourish i think sometimes it can be things as simple as just how your company makes decisions Mm -hmm. and that can vary from level to level in the org chart Mm -hmm. versus having one particular decision making process that everybody kind of utilizes and that can form some of the culture that's a great point, Tony. I mean, and, and that's something that like, I'm not sure that leaders don't necessarily think about, but it's like, yes, go ahead and like codify the way you want people to make decisions. And, and then like, to your point, like engage everyone, roll that out and, and make sure that everyone uses it uniformly. What's a, and I know in our business, um, using client names can sometimes be a confidential issue or it can be something the client's okay with, but what's a fusion type project you're really proud of? where you've seen this really work well transformationally. You know, I'd actually have to go back to my very first experience at Sony because I think that it was so new and different at the time that I think, frankly, I probably didn't have high expectations for it. Um, and we were all, we were just kind of learning. We were I want to say we were making up as we go along, but we were trying to figure out how do you integrate brand and culture. And um, I think one of the the things that I was most proud of was the work that I did fostering collaboration between marketing and human resources to the point where after we had gone through the bulk of our work, we would go to conferences like I would take my human resources people to marketing conferences. They could talk about what they did and they would bring me to HR conferences and I would talk about what we did. And it was just this really great transformation that we were able to undertake where everything from recruiting to onboarding to learning and development and the way that we did performance planning was all transformed and oriented around our core values and our what we called at the time our core belief, but it was a brand purpose. One of the things I love to do with a CEO is say, so we need to talk about your brand. And they'll say, okay, well, we need to sit down with sales and marketing. And I'll say, no, we need HR. <laughs> and they'll say, why? And I'll say, well, it's going to affect recruiting. Mm-hmm. And then I say, oh, and we're going to need your CFO too. And they'll say, why? I said, well, it's going to affect, it's an asset. So it's an intangible asset that represents something on your balance sheet. So we need this. And so they're just not thinking about how all these things interconnect. And it's the same way with culture. You know, they Mm want to go get the HR Mm -hmm. people. And I'm like, well, actually, we're going to need everybody on your team for that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're having those conversations with CEOs and business leaders because I think that it's not for lack of trying or lack of wanting. I think it's just lack of knowledge and understanding. And so I think that if you can help them see that these things really are all interrelated and they all are interdependent, then I think that they have a new appreciation and a new value for this work. Hey, it takes all of us to forward these ideas, right? (laughs) Yeah. Hey, I know mileage may vary, but on average... uh, Uh, reading your book and all, if I want to institute and execute this, how long should I be thinking in my mind that it might take? Yeah, this is hard to say, but I would say anywhere from three to five years. You know, I think the first year is probably just kind of figuring out your core purpose and your single set of core values and kind of mapping out where you want to go. And then it'll take at least another couple of years to execute on most of it. And then probably another couple of years before you really start to see the results and start to see it become very intuitive and ingrained in your organization. 
So I got a standard list of closing questions I want to throw at you. Okay. And uh, I'll just put these at you in rapid fire succession. And just the answer that comes to mind is what I'm looking for. And are you ready? Sure. All right. <laughs> Best memory that immediately comes to mind for you. Yeah, so la is very immediate or very recent. Um, last weekend, my niece and nephew came to visit, and we cycled across the Golden Gate Bridge. And this was the first time that I'd ever done it. I just moved here about a year and a half ago, and it was kind of one of these iconic things you're supposed to do. And we finally did it, and it was a gorgeous day, and we had a lot of fun. Um, and so it was just a great memory. Perfect. Number one hero in your life. I have to say my husband, you know, when I think about hero, I think about someone who rescues and protects and supports me and he does all of that and so much more. Top value you subscribe to? Oh gosh. Um, I think commitment. If you're going to do something, do it well, do it with excellence and make sure you do it. Most important person in your life? Yeah. So again, have to go to my husband. He really is the best husband in the world. So yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite thing in the whole world? Little known secret, but I am a teddy bear enthusiast, and so I have lots of teddy bears, and it would be one of them, I think. <laughs> you know, Build-A-Bear is in St. Louis. It is. It is, and I actually have a Build-A-Bear. Great. What's your favorite food? Oh, Mexican, for sure. Being in California, especially from San Diego, for sure. Well, if you're ever in Colombia, I'd take you to lunch or dinner. We got the best Mexican place in town right oh, next really? door. Oh, really? Interesting. Yes. In Colombia, huh? Yep. Okay. Um, most beautiful place you've ever been to? New Zealand, by far. Um, it really does look like in the Lord of the Rings movies. Well, that's pretty awesome. If you could describe success in one word, what would that be? I have to do three words. Is that okay? I'd say um, fulfilling your purpose. Love it. How would you want to be remembered? Um, I think it would be that, that I want to be remembered for fulfilling my purpose, which is to help business people create real value for the world. All right. Advice for a younger Denise. Value relationships over the work. What's your favorite sound? I am a rock and roll girl at heart. So an Eddie <laughs> um, Van Halen guitar riff is probably one of my favorite things to listen to. That was just what I was thinking about. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and finally, what, what is the best lesson you've learned? I think it has to be around identifying what your purpose is and then sticking to it. It helps clarify so many things. Denise Lee Yon has been our guest today, and her last name is spelled Y-O-H-N if you're looking for her on Google. And I highly recommend her book, What Great Brands Do. I've previously read that one. And then her latest book we've been talking about today is Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies. Denise, uh, tell everybody how to find you just on your website, and you got a lot of great resources. So. Sure. Well, Tony, first of all, thank you so much for hosting this conversation. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I appreciate the opportunity to share about Fusion. Just go to my website, deniseleon.com. It's kind of a portal for you then to learn more about Fusion and, and get access to free downloadable materials. From my website, deniseleon.com, you can access my blog and newsletter, um, and then all my social media links, and then information about my keynote presentations. And of course, my favorite is your Twitter feed. Yes, so, uh, I think that's actually how we connected individually, even though I guess yeah. we had seen each other at the conference. But yes, it's a great way. To yeah, I mean, as you're as you're meeting thousands of people, <laughs> you know, so and I really appreciate you emailing me those latest resources, too. I, I've enjoyed a couple of those podcasts and I'll reciprocate and send you some of my favorites also. I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Are you working twice as hard, but enjoying fewer rewards? Maybe you're highly accomplished, but you just can't seem to break through and make the next big move. Or you run a business that has begun to grow stagnant. It doesn't have to stay that way. Even the best leaders have felt as if their careers were spiraling out of control, but that's when they had to lead and lead big. Tony Richard's new book, The Big Idea, 52 Ways to Be a Better Leader Now, will help launch you forward in leadership. Learn how to take charge and lead yourself, lead others, and lead your company. Purchase online today at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and our website, clearvisiondevelopment.com.